no problem don't worry another day sometime except a very so that makes uh, to shilu a very special hello <laughs> and, and very very warm greetings to everybody else present in the panel it's my Thank pleasure you. to see all of you Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, be because we you have to go very quickly for another meeting. Uh, I will quickly move on to Alok. Alok, I would request you uh, to you know to set the context and give a quick yeah. brief yeah. on the EHS policies and practices right. in India. Right, right, absolutely. I'm going to keep it very short. But before that, um, I'm so delighted to have such an esteemed panelist uh, on board. Um, as everyone knows covid-19 has been one of the most uh, uh one of the worst pandemics uh, of our time and uh, let's face it it's uh, it's here to stay uh, the only option that we all have ahead of us is to accept uh, the situation and uh, adapt to the best part you know ability uh, we as an ethnologists uh, feel that schools are perhaps the most unique place to fall um for starters children and young adults are the next generation of uh, caregivers scientists doctors um, and agents of change disruptions caused to them implies exacerbating the crisis exponentially um so way we have been uh, perceiving and looking at ehs or environment health and you know uh, safety issues in various other sectors like so oil and gas pharmaceuticals mining and power uh, have been perceived it has been perceived you know uh, uh with a lot of priority and urgency uh, especially because of the kind of risk which is involved uh i think it's time that we start looking at the perceived risk even at the school level with a similar degree of priority and urgency uh but while we do that there are a lot of challenges and uh, constraints that we have to work with uh for example uh unlike some other activities or 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 uh, uh, businesses or some other sectors who cannot go 100% digital um in fact uh to the best of my understanding the population of students uh population density of students in india is much larger than anywhere else in the world as well um so with these constraints and lots more that you want to understand from this uh, webinar uh i'm extremely delighted to have this team uh panel who will discuss these challenges uh with greater perspective and share their thoughts uh for the road ahead uh so over to you priya and really looking forward to the webinar thank you alok uh so quickly you know as alok highlighted that you know uh, and also because environment health and safety practices have been an integral part of all kinds of spaces and operations where life or environment is at risk now educational institutions as schools colleges universities they are also required to mandatorily perform up to the prescribed norms for ehs and there is a school safety manual uh, of 2018 and others which uh, prescribe key parameters that school must adhere to such as the infrastructure safety health transportation student protection cyber safety and some other as well now however this pandemic has created a need to reevaluate this checklist to ensure the health and safety of students staff families without compromising on the quality of education that we are providing while the schools are still figuring out the best possible online education mechanism at the moment one cannot ignore uh, the preparedness required for schools to reopen in near future um international organizations who local governments they are all prescribing a necessary guidelines for social distancing safety and hygiene but how will all this look and feel in a school setting is still out of the purview for many educators and parents and this webinar will address some of the key uh, ehs aspects that the schools uh, level that we can be followed uh before we begin the panel discussion i would like to highlight an important point on behalf of all our panelists now we are in the middle of the pandemic and there is no clear or sure short solution to the ehs requirements that are caused as a result of this hence through this panel discussion we are only looking forward to gather perspectives recommendations and ideas and possible solutions for safe school operations 
Um, I will very quickly move to Dr. Lata because she has to leave in early for another very important meeting uh, regarding the new education policy. Dr. Lata, I would like you to, uh, you know, focus on, uh, you know, what would be your key suggestions towards ensuring adequate social distancing and safety norms, keeping in consideration the average Indian classroom has a very high teacher-student ratio of around 1 is to 30 or 1 is to 40 as well. And also a second point that we would like you to highlight is how would you like to, you know, uh, see uh, what is your approach going to be uh, when it comes to students of different age groups and how will we bring them back into the school system? Uh, thank you, Supriya. I think you have, between Alok and you, you have set the context on which today's discussions that you are now wanting to have uh, will move on. Uh, firstly, I want to say that, you know, in terms of just growth, I want to actually pull this, I use every opportunity I get to talk to people to salute at the teacher warriors who have really taken it on up front and done their best. So here are my salutations to them, exactly like health workers who have put their life at risk to make sure that every one of us survive. Now, having said this, I just need to say that, you know, um, it was so interesting. We call it dif difficult times. I, I think it may be a good move to say different times because when we say difficult times, there is a, there is a little bit of a, a sadness associated with it and we don't want to get sad. We are all happy and many of us have the good fortune to stay safe at home and deal with this uh, current situation. But having said all this, yes, children are at home. Parents are at home. Everybody is at home feel safe and good, but emotionally quite distracted, emotionally quite saddened, maybe. But what I do want to say now, therefore, is that while everything shut down, you know, the uh, trips and tourism, the hospitals, the malls, not sorry, not the hospitals, the malls, uh, everywhere there was total silence. There's so many places that closed down, industries, hotels, whatever you want to say. But even schools closed down but learning continued. So all credit to the very quick adjustments made by the teachers, the heads of schools, and all schools who really put their best foot forward to make sure that the learning doesn't stop. And hence, I would think that while this is on, I wouldn't be saying by any standards that the best has been done. The best effort certainly has come forth. Along with this, you get guidelines from the ministries, from the MHRD, that is in terms of education. You're getting it from NCRT, you're getting it from CBSC, you're getting it from disaster management areas, you're getting it from states. You're getting a lot. It's a mail every day that tells you how to go about it. Therefore, schools need to really think through this very carefully and put a one, two, three, four for what they need to be doing. Right now, their focus is how learning can be delivered, from age three to age 17, and that's going on in all schools because nothing is going to stop really. Now, you want me to focus on how the schools will reopen given the student-teacher ratio being very high. Yes. Somehow, for whatever reasons, 31st of uh, August until then, we don't expect schools to reopen. And of course, I saw the Haryana government circular which says they're trying to open schools as early as possible, at least from class 10 onwards, 10, 11, and 12. Whichever class, when the school reopens, I think the protocols have to be very, very clearly followed. So it is in terms of schools infrastructure, it is in terms of travel infrastructure, it is in terms of age groups, and it is in terms of pedagogy and its deliverance that we really need to look at. And it's a very vast chapter. However, to summarize some of the key points, I would think, and I'm sure my colleagues on the panel would agree with me and have a lot more to add. That is that when we look at the school infrastructure, there are schools from one acre of land to 28 acres of land. So there's a lot of land. Uh, there's a lot of space issue and constraints, good, bad, and average. So when we look at that, one thing is very clear that the protocols set up, whether it is about how children will first enter and a no touch process, absolutely, and how safe they will be when they enter the school premises, 
how the sanitization process is on, how they will walk through tunnels of sanitizers if schools can afford it, how they will walk, walk into their classrooms, and before that, very detailed circulars to the parents as to how the schools are going about it. Things like masks, sanitizers, and washing hands with soap again and again, these three are standards. Basically, we have to focus also on the fact that it will be uh, guiding students for their own personal safeties because a lot of things around cannot change. We can see that the pandemic is going up and down and there is absolutely no clarity as to when this will be off. So that is number one. Number two, I think there has to be a lot of detailed conversation and clarity between the school and the parents and a lot of stakeholding opinions be taken before we even set the process of reopenings in process. The parent-teacher meets will have to assure, will have to be assured. Parent, I'm talking of the executive meeting, which will uh, go through the entire protocol set forth by the government and the agent, government agencies that are concerned with the school, which tells us how to reopen schools and have this detailed conversation because what is okay for one school and their set of parents may not be okay for another school and their set of parents. And therefore this has to be done on a school to school basis because each school has a different infrastructure. Then once they are in school, it's very clear that because of the high pupil teacher ratio, all of them cannot come to school together. They will come in rotation. They will come in shifts. Two things which will really not happen in the near future is the sports as in field games, and also all the co-scholastic activities as in music and dance, which happens on a collective group folk basis will not happen. We may not see choirs and orchestras coming the way they do in schools. However, all of us have by now experienced that whether it's music, dance, physical education in terms of yoga, skipping, fitness, all of this is being done online and that is not too difficult. So I'm not by any chance suggesting that things will not happen. I'm saying that we all this will happen in school. When it reopens, it will be in turns and certainly the fields and the rooms and gatherings of any kind of celebrations, food, etc., will not happen. That is very clear. About food, we are awaiting certain guidelines which has yet to come and which has been discussed with the boards because residential schools are very concerned about it. And so also schools which are long day schools where breakfast, lunch and tea is served. All those schools are con very concerned about it, but it can never be a full eight hours, nine hours school for sure. This will be short duration schools and this will be in rotation because many schools will have to go into shifts, for example. Right. Now, having said all this, you know, when we look at infrastructure, the toilet management, how the people, how the children are to be guided, what are the sign systems in the school, what are the signages that will be there for children of all age groups, of all heights, of all literacy levels to read through and be visible, both for adults and for children. So all processes of sanitization, all signages will be in place. Only the number of students with their name list on a daily basis will have to be put outside and their attendance very carefully marked and children let in if and when the school reopens. I'm also here to say that, you know, because the teachers may all be there and we might go into a completely blended form of learning. And when we say blended learning in terms of how ag academic transactions will take place will be very different. And why I have to bring this in here is because it has, although it's a separate issue, why I'm bringing it in here is because this has implications on the tooling and technology infrastructure available both at home of the children, homes of the homes of the teachers, and in the schools class-wise, section-wise. When they come, there'll be partly, uh, there'll be, I don't think there'll be a gathering of more than 10 children in a class distanced, although they say six feet, but I think there is a UNESCO guideline which says not less than eight to 10 feet. So there are these variations and I do not, I cannot speak for everyone saying how it's going to be really possible for all of them, but I think this is certainly the guideline and that may be perhaps the safest. So that is one. Secondly, I think uh, we need to be very cautious and careful that, you know, the distancing from the black, 
from the whiteboard, blackboard, or whatever demonstrations and learnings that happen in the classroom, children will still need to carry their devices and be allowed because even within the school, this is the latest thing that people are discussing, that it may be a good idea for these children to carry their technology tools, whichever they have, so that the instructional transactions, if any, can carry on in the same way. Because while part of them are being are seeing each other, they are the teacher and the taught face to face, the other are sitting at home and doing the same kind of work. The idea of their bringing them back is to make sure that all facilities for any kind of experiential learning, for any kind of practicals, for any kind of lab work, all of that is there. And each of these surfaces will need, therefore, because there'll be touching material, a lot of sanitizing practices, and making sure that everything they touch or do is safe. There is another proposal that they may not do things, it will only be demonstrations. So I think a lot of infrastructure changes will happen. And I can also see touchless uh, sanitizers and you know uh, the temperature checks and all of this where nobody touches anything, which is all happening even now within communities, within gated colonies, all of that will definitely be happening in school. And therefore, if you look at a whole list of things, all of that is available. It is, I don't think right now, as we are sitting and talking, I need to put down one, two, three, four, enter at the gate, um, make sure the attendance is done, temperatures are checked, oxygen levels are checked, and then we move in and then walk through definitive pathways and tracks decided because they are sanitized. Don't touch anything. There are those foot operated doors, which are with uh, additions, which I think schools will have to do so that nobody's touching it. Nobody's touching handles. They walk into tables and chairs and sit down at that distancing, which is mentioned, carry their gadgetry, take the instructions. And here it will not be a regular teaching like the face to face that happened earlier. I think the new normal is very clear that the blended kind of learning, which has many pedagogies of inquiry, search, research, all of that will come into this. And from the lowest class to the highest class, I think some practices, transactional practices and pedagogies will change. Where the critical thing will be that the responsibility for learning will now largely shift to the children. So these are some of the things. It's very difficult to talk infrastructure without bringing in what needs to be transacted through that infrastructure. That is one. Now coming to the other one is, first of all, the transport from home to the school in which the children are coming. There are walker parents, there are car parents, there are school transport parents. All of them will have to be sent details of the routes, of the way the, uh, you know, the, the presence of all, uh, the absolutely sanitized way of the transport, the drivers, their health checkups done, the conductors, the didis in the bus, all their health checkup done all their pre-training done, all of them explained in the local languages and in the languages that they understand what are the one, two, three, fours. Those one, two, three, fours through an assembly line to be checked every day twice, once when they enter and once before they leave. All of this will have to be done. And you know, the real difficulty will come for the preschool. And I have to say this to all of you, that in Singapore, they've said, that the most important area of, to reopen schools will be from preschools. Senior school children can sit in front of a gadget and learn, but preschool children and primary school children need to come back to school first because they are the ones who can't learn with reduced times, but with great emotional contact and social contact, which is desirable. But here, while that is true, because also the young parents are not at home, their offices have reopened, they need to go, there's no one to take care and who will look after their education school. A choice is between not sending them to school and having ministerial help at home to manage the children, which again is managing, but not education. And if you bring them back to school, you have this another para staff, which has to, because they will have to hold hands. They will need to be going to the washrooms and wash hand washes and all of that stuff. Therefore they will require support. You know, when I look at the whole scenario, the staff in school, the additional staff in school seems to be only increasing and not decreasing during these times. So I can see, and then we need health cards monitored on a 
on a weekly basis. Actually, I, we read a protocol which said every fourth day, health checkup status to be monitored, recorded, even if it is a nil report. So that needs to be done is what was being looked at. It seemed very impractical if you reopen schools because there are things which otherwise you have to do and your uh, sanatorium in school or your uh, medical facility in school may be woefully inadequate to manage so many children with this kind of record being generated. Every week sent to their parents on mails, uh, recorded in school, monitored on cameras. So when you look at this whole stuff, of course it's a challenge and I think we are talking generally of people and private schools where this is possible. I'm looking at the much larger picture where equity, access and quality is so difficult for less, I think barely 23% if, if I've read my record right, have the, even the opportunity of thinking about reopening schools. And less than three. And when we look at even within this private school system, there are schools in which there are, because we follow the RTE guidelines, there are children in schools who do not have technology support at home. So schools have been doing a brilliant job of making it available to them in as much ways as possible. But still there are bandwidth issues, there are internet issues, there are uh, connectivity issues. Even as we talk, sometimes we lose it, what to talk of them. So I think infrastructurally, there is a challenge but the challenge, because it is there, and listing one, two, three, four, I think there are lots of detailed uh, records which are coming through. And too much of listing work, one wonders whether it is really worth opening schools for all of them. Every age group, if you talk to a counselor or a psychologist, who will tell you that every age group is going through its own challenges. If the mind is not ready, that is internal infrastructure, how are they going to respond to any kind of learning? So I think, you know, and uh, where details of, uh, so whether it's transport, whether it's health, whether it is physical infrastructure, whether it is technology support and infrastructure, all of these, the bigger architecture now required for the new normal uh, is going to be, even for private schools, not cheap. It's going to be more expensive because we need that many more tools, that many more installations, that many more, record keeping, that much more uh, support staff and healthy support staff, trained support staff, supported support staff. So when we look at this whole thing, it's not going to be easy, but nobody's going to give up and we want our children back. But when we look at those little children, I mean, given that they may have a bigger need to be in schools, is that the way forward in our country? Because if you look at, and if you even remotely attempt through this seminar to look at equity issues, they're not in school, the migrant population, some of the RT children in our schools have moved out with their parents to their hometowns. What is happening to their education? How are we going to reach learning to them? So there are a whole, it's a much larger complex problem. We are looking at, I think, a very small percentage of privileged children who can even think of coming back to school as of now but we all them, want them back. The three years don't know what's happening to them. Thankfully, they're just secure in their homes. The five years want more company, they're not getting it. Why five years? If you look at the entire primary age group, while they, because they are millennials and they can handle tooling and technology a little better than we think they can, and they're beginning to learn, respond, send, all kinds of things that they're successfully doing, dancing, singing, choir, music, playing, skipping, yoga, everything they're doing at home, but they all want to be back. Learning cannot happen until you're emotionally and socially ready for it. Therefore, I think that's a huge concern which must bring back the children to school. And then we are not even beginning to talk about the adolescents whose internal infrastructure, the mental infrastructure, the emotional infrastructure, all of that is, is under huge threat. We did hear, it's not unusual to talk about it. We did hear of the boys' locker room. We did hear of a lot of distress among children. And I think all of, for us as educators, I think my colleagues on the panel will agree with me. The problem is a, lo is a lot more complex than what we think it is. And providing for in terms of anything that is physical 
is a lot more easier done than everything else which is not physical stuff. Nobody will take the risk of opening schools without following the detailed protocols. I mean, we're not going to things like details like a doormat and how are we sanitizing them and how it, it needs to be done every two hours. Yeah, I'm not going into such details as we are having this conversation. But it starts even there. So, you know, and every time a person goes into a certain area, when they come out, there is another set of people waiting to send. They, these are all things which are going to be very, very challenging. But I think we'll deal with it. And hopefully, there'll be other things which will come to our rescue. Supriya? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lata. I think very uh, beautifully and uh, in a very concise way, you have put in all the major points uh, and it's a, you know, beginning of a discussion. Some yeah. very interesting points that you have brought up and we'll continue with the discussion, ma'am. Uh, would you like to leave now or would you have some more time? You know what? I think I'll at least in love of my other colleagues, I'll listen to one more and then I'll leave. I will leave without disturbing anyone. Of you. Therefore, Alok, thank you very much yeah. for having me. Um, it's been such a pleasure to have you on board, ma'am. Thank you so much for making no, thank time. Thank you very much. Schedule. Yeah, now I'll attend as an attendee for a little time and then leave. All right. All right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, now move to Dr. Michael. And uh, Dr. Michael, I would request you to, you know, share your take on it, you know, uh, keeping in consideration, you know, uh, with respect to your schools and the suggestions that you would have uh, for other schools, what could be the possible ways? And also taking forward Dr. Lata's uh, recommendations and some of the ideas. Uh, are we, uh, you know, are we in the Indian setup ready to experiment with certain new approaches, such as, you know, with other countries are uh, testing out uh, the experiment of social bubbles, social parts. You know, are we ready to work out with certain interesting approaches? Uh, uh, what would be your take on this? Uh, thanks, Supriya. Um, I want to first of all thank uh, uh, Mrs. Lata for that comprehensive presentation that she gave. I just want everybody to know those are my notes that I had sent to her. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, I think she has covered such a huge... Uh, uh, area of things that leaves a uh, room for us to chew on and uh, yeah. sort of digest. But two, two uh, misnomers, if I may correct right from the word go, uh, I think it is wrong for us to say at this time, when will schools open? Because let me tell you, schools are open. Uh, yeah. It would be a great disservice to all of my teachers who have been working tremendously hard even through their summer vacation, with all of their added responsibilities of having their spouse and all other children at home and all the noise, uh, somehow finding calm and peace in that chaos and to be able to lead uh, classes. School is very much open. Attendance is very much on. Fees is very much being paid. So from that factor, let's understand that. Everything is up and operational. Uh, second thing, what I would like us to be able to understand is we not only need to learn how to live with COVID, but now as educators, we need to be able to teach how to live uh, with COVID. I find very little of the teaching pedagogy of how do we teach, which means as educationists, and I know uh, Shilu on the panel here with me is one of those uh, pioneer leaders, again in Delhi, who run their schools with their own vision and clarity of thought. And so it is now up to us educationists to come up with how we will lead our own schools. Like Dr. Lata said, one shoe size will not fit all. There cannot be one uh, policy that should cover schools all the way from the remote mountains of Uttarakhand to the heartland of New Delhi. That's not going to happen. I think uh, we need to, in our own minds, come up with the strategy of when we are going to unlock the physical gates of a building where children used to gather. And so we need to be able to make the strategy of how do we unlock it? What does unlock mean? That means like never before, there will have to be such brilliant coordination, not just between the teachers and the HODs and the vice principals and the principals, but also the security guards, also the admin office, the bus drivers, conductors, guards, the lady guards, every single person in the ecosystem of a school now needs to work together as one body, which means everybody needs to know that the minute the child who is the actual client 
for which all of these things have been set up. The minute a child is going to walk into the school, to the time the child reaches home, we need to be able to map out that entire protocol, which means on the uh, online portals that we are talking to our children with, the WhatsApp groups for the parents, an increased level of communication so that they know that if your child is, say, Aparna Kosla, so Aparna needs to arrive at the gate at this time and will be going to room number so and so at this time. And that entire process needs to be monitored. Uh, online, I want to address this because this is not something new. Online learning has been happening for many, many years now. Our children, unfortunately, haven't been properly guided, but they've learned all kinds of things uh, online for many years, whether it's just browsing Google or YouTube or whatever. So they are used to the pedagogy of logging on and learning. What is different now is when they're logging on, their class teacher is now visible and their classmates are visible. So all the learning they did in the privacy of their room is now a shared environment. So there is a online social setup that is happening. So now we need to learn and then be able to teach how do we make this social interaction viable, a little more real. We will have to come up. We don't know the answers, but we certainly need to try different ways. There are many times we will fail, but there is nothing wrong in failing as long as we are trying. So what now we need to come up with that uh, explanation of how we are doing it. One of the things that we are already planning is that at a senior level, say from grade eight to grade 12, come middle of September, we will propose to hold physical first term exams within the school building, which means, now this is a target that I have set for the entire staff. What does that mean? That means we are now working towards that to be able to ensure so that children have something to look forward to a day out, uh, uh, teachers and schools and everybody else start to prepare. The whole thing may get stopped, but as long as we are ready and we know it can work. So that's where we are heading. Protocol for us would mean that we take nine children to a classroom uh, and then break down. So if you have 40 children to a class, that means you will need minimum of four to five classrooms per class. So if you're holding your eighth exam and you've got six sessions uh, sections, that means 24 classrooms will get used just for that. So you regulate your days and you do it in such a way that everybody is working um, and everybody is safe and we're able to teach how to live with COVID. That is gonna be critical. Um, I think also uh, as equally essential is for us to be able to ensure that our classrooms are now wired. So even if we do open, and if we have 45 children in that classroom, at nine children a day, all 45 can visit once a week when classes happen. And the class still needs to go online so that the balance 36 students at home are studying. Then another nine will come from there uh, the next morning, and these are back home. So we need to start being innovative, creative, and we need to start uh, putting these experiments um, into practice uh, and then we'll see how it works out. Great, great. Some very uh, important points, you know, as Dr. Michael, you said, we have to experiment with a lot of techniques. We cannot say at this moment what would work, what would not work. Uh, something that would work in one particular school, one classroom may not work in another. Something that would work with one age group will not work with another. So there has to be a lot of uh, experimentation, a lot of new protocols that need to be set. And this looks like we are, in a way, recreating the whole school infrastructure, the operations, right? Um, and while we're talking about the technology, uh, Michelu, I would like you to focus on, you know, you have been uh, working very actively towards the underprivileged uh, children uh, in your school. Now, if we have to work on so much with technology, even when they're coming to school, for example, uh, how will this all happen and uh, how do you ensure that these children are, are not left out and they are still in the system, very much in the system? Uh, thank you, uh, Supriya. It's not only the underprivileged children that our school uh, focuses on, it's also the developmentally challenged. 
I must tell you that, uh, you know, uh, the children who have got special needs, teachers even are taking classes at five and six in the evening so that the parents have to be with them. So they have to be, uh, somebody has to be sitting with them. So in the morning they would go to work, they would leave their children in the school and go off. But here, now they can't do that. So teachers have been taking classes even at five o'clock, six o'clock. The last class was at seven. Then I said, you, know, you all also must keep a certain timing for yourself and not just go on the whole day. That is one. Uh, all the physical aspects that Michael and Lata Ma'am have talked about is absolutely accurate. And yes, we really, if push comes to shove, there is not a single private school who will not do their best to do what has to be done. Yes, as Michael said, we will all formulate our own ways to do it. We have to be really in sync with so many people, uh, the parents, the teachers. I mean, they all, they have, now we all have to work as one body, literally. And that is going to be challenging, but it's not something that anyone is worried about. What worries me is even this nine and 10 children coming in, the first thing that I have to look at is what is happening to them emotionally right now. How much have they understood of what has transpired? Because I know I'm having a lot of trouble with some of my students and this some are just, you know, uh, showing it. The others are not showing it. But when they come to school, it's going to come up all over again. The emotional support that they will need is going to be mind boggling. So I feel the teachers will have to be sensitized. And, you know, literally, they have to be told how they have to behave with each individual child with love, empathy. It's, these are all words which are simple, but you know, as a human being, it takes a lot of training to actually, to actually be prepared to react in a manner that is full of love and empathy. So that is something that teachers will have to be trained for. We'll have to, um, you know, sensitize continuously to help students to talk, to share, to not think like, I had to call so many children personally and say if something happens, if you are feeling worried, pick up the phone and talk to me. Talk to one of your heads, talk to one of uh, the, uh, your teachers. Uh, and uh, it's, it's th that is what I feel that, I mean, uh, I read an article recently which talked about emotional rehabilitation and it made a lot of sense to me. So all these physical things that, See, the government will lay down certain rule, uh, rules and certain protocol. How we will do it will become completely our, uh, our system. I don't know how the costs are going to work out because all this is going to cost money. And I can't see parents saying, okay, you are supplying sanitizer to my child. So here, take some extra money. They are not going to be happy with any of this. Uh, they definitely want their children to go to school. Parents are really, really finding it very difficult to keep their children at home. They just turn around and they just say, they just don't listen to us, which is a fact. Even when schools were open, that's what they used to say. Our children don't listen to you, they listen to you. Ma'am, will you please do this? Will you please tell them this? Yeah, fine. I can do that. I know they listen to me. But, uh, and the teachers, and the other heads, and the vice principals. So it's all a huge team that is going to now have to suddenly change their, what they call, it's going to be an entire paradigm shift. Yes. You've got to start thinking so very differently. But I think, I think as teachers, as educators, uh, the, 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 you know, the jargon of lifelong learners, yes, that's what we are. We adapt, we learn, and we will fix. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. Dr. Michael, I will bring this question to you again. You know, uh, how do you see all these required changes are going to impact the operational cost of the school? Uh, you know, how will this impact uh, the level of teacher training that needs to be really reworked in a completely different way in order for more socio-emotional uh, support that the teachers need to provide? 
Well, first, I just want to say that, Shilu, you're a rock star, and I'm such a huge fan of you. I just love everything that you said, and it is absolutely right. Uh, it is important for us to understand that we as teachers need to be the first to call ourselves students. We are students of life, and we need to be learning every single day. And uh, as far as understanding uh, the psychology of the child, and it is a fact that these children will need a lot of human love. I would love to say human touch, but touch is not going to happen. But they will need that. They will need that connect in a huge way. One of the negative things that we have seen of this lockdown is that incidents of spousal abuse at all have increased tremendously, which is very sad because here are people who never spent time together, forget about quality time, haven't spent time together, but now of course to stay locked in. There may be just one device. Everybody's trying to share and eat their time uh, from that. How much more troubling it is for that child who may have found school to be the last reclusive place that he or she could run to and meet up with similar friends and just be away for a few hours. That window is also gone. So it is very important that we understand as teachers, the very first thing when we wake up in the morning and see our kids who are in their homes, and we don't know if that is a happy place or a difficult place for that child that morning. Uh, but yes, to be super sensitive and alert to that, in spite of whatever we are dealing with back home, to understand the importance of the spoken word, the power, that a teacher has from the very first good morning and the way you smile and greet that child and personalize the meeting for that child, it can make or break a day, a week, a month, or a life. So that is very critical. Uh, coming to the actual cost of doing business in schools as far as moving forward is concerned, it is a fact. People are hurting. Jobs are lost. Businesses are shut. I think travel and trade, tourism, hotels, restaurants, uh, all of these have taken a tremendous hit. And uh, yes, there are people that are bleeding their life savings, just trying to eke it through, not knowing when this will end. And, and uh, I shudder to think, and I pray every night to the Lord Almighty, that the poorest of poor who were dependent on a physical labor job somewhere, which required large congregation, they're not able to do that. That somehow God sustains them through this uh, dark and difficult period. But yes, I don't see uh, uh, parents uh, opening up on the majority. There is a large philanthropic group within the parents too uh, that would come forward. We ran uh, a little uh, program within our schools called the Good Samaritan Program, which right at the beginning of the school year, when uh, we went on to online, we realized that some of those who were economically disadvantaged uh, children may not have access to uh, devices. We reached out to our parents and said, look, if you've got a spare device, uh, and we needed about uh, 60 odd devices, in a matter of a week, we had 60 devices. Parents came forward. Many of them said, look, I can't pay uh, for, and we had figured out one that was gonna cost 10,000 rupees. They said, look, we can't pay. 10,000, can we put a thousand rupees in? And little by little, but they came forward in their darkest hour, they still reached out. So that gives me great hope in humanity. That gives me great hope in the ability of parents who are also human beings like you and me to be able to understand that, look, there are others who have needs too. So I think as a nation, uh, we need to be able to look right now, not just ourselves selfishly and say, how can I just make it through? You gotta look and say, how can I plus one more, make it through. If we can just pick that attitude, I think uh, we have a good future. India is a country of love. We are people with the greatest of hospitality senses and the ability to offer a cup of tea to a stranger has, is not alien to us. Atiti Devo Bhava, we've all been taught that, but now is the time to put it into practice. Enough of theory, enough of talk. So moving forward, I, I, I really want that all my parents, my teachers, and my countrymen, fellow brothers and sisters, understand the need of the hour is to reach out, is to stretch our budget and reach out 
to corners that we have never reached out to and make sure that plus one is going to be okay. That's the need of the hour. I think that's how little by little we will crawl our way out of this economic distress that we find ourselves in. Otherwise, the road will be extremely long if we stay selfish. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Michael. I think we all need to be together at this time and going ahead also, you know. I think the new normal will bring in people together more than ever. And that is what was required at different levels as well. When we're looking at sustainability issues, education as an issue or other social aspects of, you know, the world that we are facing now. Um, Ms. Shilu, uh, what would be your, uh, you know, uh, key points that you would like to address to parents, you know, in terms of the support that you would want at this moment? Uh, what would be your message to parents at this stage? Uh, I would first and foremost tell them that just because the children are there at home all the time, do not over-supervise. The, the children are not used to having them all the time telling them what to do, which seems to be a way with Indian parents all the time telling children what to do, you know? And um, the other thing is like, I went into each class when these uh, classes started. And what we did was we had a class on, on the hour, every hour. It would be for 40 minutes and we would give them a 20 minutes break. So I would tell them that these 20 minutes, uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to quickly go play a game? Or are you quickly going to, going to go and um, make sure that you complete the serial that you hadn't watched last night? What are you going to do? So they, of course, look most affronted and they say, no, ma'am. So I said, okay, now all of you are very good children. I agree, you will not do anything wrong, but let me tell you what you're supposed to do. So what you got to do is you've got to go, you've got to shake your limbs. So do these exercises. And we have PT periods, we've got yoga, we've got singing, we've got dancing, we've got chess, we've got skipping, we've got all those classes going on. But these 20 minutes is monitor free. So you have to walk around your house, you have to move your limbs, and you have to go and wash your face. But why should you be walking around aimlessly? Um, that was my question to them. So they, they would look uh, most confused. Now, what does she want us to do? Uh, so I said, go ask your mother. What can you do to help her? What, go pick one corner of the house and say, Mama, I'm going to do the dusting, whether you're a girl or a boy. I'm going to do the dusting of this area, these 20, 10 minutes. Because give only 10 minutes out of the 20, huh? 10 minutes are for yourself. 10 minutes are for uh, what you can do to help your mother, your father. So that I felt sat very well with the parents also. I got a lot of comments about it. That, you know, once you said that, everybody did try to. Because I told them it will be very, very disheartening for me if when lockdown finishes, because it will finish one day, remember, when they come and tell me, ma'am, what have you taught these children? They were so not helpful at home. I want each of your parents to come and tell me what wonderful upbringing you have given these. So I put everything usually on me. It's my upbringing. It's my, uh, you know, uh, problem. And if you don't behave, a little bit of emotional blackmail, of course, uh, saying that if you don't behave, then people will say, I haven't taught you well. The school has not taught you well. So I felt... We have to teach. Academics is going to go on one way or the other, but they can't lose in touch with what they should be doing, what the, the, the expectations of behavior, which has been part of your school life, suddenly you cannot, because the parents can't say anything. The parents are scared to say anything, really I'm telling you. They, they are worried about everything they say, ki, oh, what if he does this? What if he does that? So don't be so negative. You know, like, don't think. Your children are not so weak. So don't worry about it. So, yeah. So this is how we went about it. And that is what I feel, that when this emotional touch will be there, I don't know when it's going to happen, though, again, really, because I can't see... And there's no chance of a vaccine being produced. Even if the vaccine is suddenly comes about, the strain may change. Who knows? So I don't know. But yes, 
schools must reopen. I agree 100%. How are we going to do it? What are we going to do? We'll have to be seen. Um, I, have, I, have, I have one quick question. Um, is there a possibility of uh, conducting or executing some kind of... Um, we can't hear you properly. There's a lot of echo in the background. Okay, is it better? There, yeah. there may be another device parallelly running yeah. in your room. So you just mute the other device if it's there. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Alok. Right. Um, so question of effective coach, even my Dr. Michael is, uh, are you both looking at some kind of Alok, we can't hear you again. I think you have to uh, mute the admin. Hello. Uh, is it, is it yes. better? Much yes. better. Okay, I think this should work now. So, yes. uh, are, you, are you looking at conducting some kind of pilot or controlled execution of some of the plans and experimentation in school um, that maybe before any kind of government guidelines comes in, that would allow you to understand what kind of uh, unseen challenges may drop up um, and may be able to plan better? So, any kind of pilot of any kind of product, any kind of experiment that's in your radar right now? Michael? Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, look, we the school has been running. There is, uh, Shilu sitting in her office right now. So right. all schools have been running. Uh, my PA is coming. Teachers are, uh, HODs are there. The sweepers are there. The Malis are there. The drivers admin. So we have been experimenting for the last four months, so as to say. Right. And uh, right. by the grace of God, and I literally mean by the grace of God, we've been completely COVID-free and nobody has been infected, right. nothing has been passed on. So right. from that point of view, but I must tell you, the discipline that has come within the staff, everybody comes with their masks, some wear gloves, some wear shields in front. They get to their places. We have uh, sanitization material available from the gate to each individual office room everywhere. So these right. protocols have come in and things are right. working. But but you must remember, policy is also written by people like you and me. Right. These are not uh, semi-gods who sit and write policy. They are human beings who are as prone to mistakes, who have as many fears of experimentation. All of that is common. So uh, like I said, it is time for us to step up our game and say, we've been watching, we've been learning. Now let's start teaching how to live with COVID. We will all come up with our strategies. And right. I'll tell you this, at Mount Carmel, we're already working on a, a open door policy as to when uh, Unlock School comes in and how we will go about it. We're even thinking, even from the junior level, especially for the nursery KG class one, even if we call one class, and one section of that class once in a month and created like a picnic environment for them with social right. distance. The children get to look forward to that one day that they're going to come to the school, back to that building that they love, that playground. We have sanitized everything. We have provided uh, enough room and space and activities for them to do where they're still able to meet, talk without that social contact, but still be able to have a day out. The concept is, right. can we give them a day out where we can uh, curate it to the most sanitized, uh, safe, possible standards that we right. as educationists can do? And can we plan right. the pedagogy of what will happen over there so it's something to look forward right. to? So these are things that we are working with. And certainly in the next few days, you will see many schools already starting to roll out things that they will be doing. And, uh, and I just pray for success for each school and each principal and each teacher and a HOD who's taking this huge risk to step out and try something. May they have the power and strength to do it and may they have full success. Absolutely. Uh, Sheila, ma'am, uh, what would be your take on this? I personally feel that if I can get about 10 children, 12 children in one go to the school, I would be comfortable with it. Anything more than that, my fear is, should anything happen, parents are not going to spare you. They're going yeah. to tell you, why did you 
take the initiative when even the government has not told you to do this. So you see, so I, I would be very, very careful uh, to bring children into school till the policy comes up that, okay, now you're free to do it. Uh, Shilu, ma'am, uh, you know, uh, we'll start taking up the questions now, uh, uh, you know, uh, because there are a lot of uh, questions coming in okay. and people are asking, you know, uh, what would be your perspective on, you know, whether we should bring the primary first in or the secondary, uh, the senior secondary in? Because they're very different perspectives. So what is your take on it? Again, again, uh, the pre-primary children, like I would say classes one, say, we're talking class one or we're talking about prep. Those children definitely need it much more than the seniors. But at the same time, the gap in learning is happening with the seniors. So again, maybe we can have one class of that and one class of this. You know, two different sections entirely. But again, it is not, I don't think I can say the need of the five-year-olds is more than the need of the 16-year-old. Right. Dr. Michael, what would you say on this? No, I, I have to completely agree with Shilu on this point, uh, that both are equally important. Uh, the youngest of the young, I feel somehow because they have a lesser ability to be able to grapple and understand what is happening. Uh, they react on an impulse, on a very natural based need. The older children are able to somehow understand. They may not agree, they may not want to cooperate, but they certainly understand. So from that point of view, I think the smaller child uh, needs a little something extra. Uh, and that is how human beings have been created. That is why the human child takes the longest in nature to become independent and grow. So I, I think that the smallest, the class one, class two, and I completely agree with you that they need something extra. We need to understand how we are going to do it. Yes, the education content, especially for my 11th and 12th standard students who are looking at this dark abyss, board exams not happening, will they happen again next year? Nobody knows. So for these kids, there are fears that we need to quell and we need to make sure that academically, they're getting what they need at this age. But the little children need more than academics. They need something else. They need that love. They need that social structure. They need that bonding that should start happening, which is so vital to developing relationships, healthy relationships uh, when they grow old. So it's a balance and we will have to try our level best to find out what that balance is. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of questions are coming in and my question also, you know, because when they're coming together and, and if they're not being able to connect in a way which used to happen earlier, they're not uh, able to touch each other, they are at a distance. Do you feel there'll still be, uh, you know, a lot of socio-emotional challenges that will come up while you're together and still not together in a way? You're still so distant and you have to interact in a very distant manner. And especially with the younger children, you'll have to, you know, train them in a way that this is a person next to you and still you cannot be close enough. You cannot touch, you can't do a high five, you know, you can't pat on the back. So, uh, you know, how will this affect, you know, uh, on the social emotional part, a very differently? And if they're not, if it's still very difficult, will it really make sense to bring them together, make that so much of effort bringing it uh, together, bring so many changes, which requires a lot of cost? But that is exactly what we are all talking about. We are saying that we have to teach them to live in the new normal, the so-called new normal. Now, this is something we have to live with probably for the next couple of years. So it has to become something that we have to train them for. And human beings adapt, human beings learn, children learn very well, but it has to be reiterated, taught, it, you cannot just tell them once and help them to uh, and help expect them to just do what you're saying. No, it has to be reiterated. They don't have these halos. Neither are they devils. You know, they're quite good. They're quite fine. They will learn if you tell them why it is so and why we need to do this. Or else, what is the other option? We'll all go back again to lockdown state. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Dr. You Michael? Know, Supriya, if I may just say this, 
when you are asking a question of the costs involved and is it worth it, I think you need to juxtapose it as compared to what? As compared to, because even though you may think you're not teaching, but let me tell you that child is learning by watching. What is that child learning? The child is learning today that if something serious happens on this planet, get inside your house and lock yourself in. That is the cure. Because the grown-ups around me haven't been able to figure out what else to do. And I've watched it day and night. Now it started in March and now this is August and I'm locked in the house. So that's the way life should be. So every time a problem is going to hit, we're telling the kids that look, as adults, we're teaching you, learn to escape and get it into your house and lock yourself. There's nothing else you can do. So I'm saying juxtapose your question to that. So what is the cost implication of teaching a child that escapism is the way to live? It's the right way. So I stand up and I think what Shiru is also saying uh, is that, look, we understand that's what we're teaching them right now. So no matter what the cost implications are, we have to, as an imperative, come up with an alternative. We cannot let the status carry on. I agree that I don't see a vaccine coming up available to every one of my parents for their children for the next three years. That's a real possibility before the entire population has it. But what does that mean? That means we've got to tell them, look, even in the toughest of times, we keep saying the tough get going, but here we're saying, no, hide. We need to come up with that strategy. Yes, yes it is risky. But whoever said that life is without risks, whoever guaranteed a bed of roses with no thorns, that's not how life is. This is the reality. And we need to be able to punctuate that. I'll tell you, Supriya, can you consider for a minute that maybe the government issues those PPEs, the personal protection gears. That means every child walks in with their glove, the mask, the little visor. They can high five when they're completely covered. I don't see that. But I, I can tell you that when the child comes together with his best friend and they're able to crack that one joke or maybe even just listen to the voice of their laughter, uh, it's going to make a difference. True. It is going to make a difference from yes. their normal of what they are being forced to every day because we couldn't come up with a better plan. I don't think it's good enough that we can sit back and say, hey, we don't have a plan. It's not good enough. Wonderfully put, Dr. Michael and Ms. Shilu. You know, this is a very important point that we need to put across uh, to all the parents and all the teachers, you know, who are working very hard that whatever happens, no matter what, you know, even if the costs go high, uh, even if we have to ensure so much of social distancing and safety norms, it is absolutely worth the social emotional development and the psychological development of the children to be with each other, to be with others. And, you know, for their lifelong learning, it is a very important aspect that we still come with each other, even if it's once a month or once a week, no matter what. Very important point here, yes. Thank you so very much. Uh, I would now request Alok, uh, you know, to uh, summarize the key points and uh, suggest the way forward. Uh, thank you, Supriya. Um, I, I guess we are in no position to uh, suggest uh, any kind of way forward, uh, any better than um, you know, what our esteemed panelists have been able to do. Um, there are a couple of points that I would definitely like to highlight. Um, and taking two from uh, what Dr. Michael was suggesting, I think uh, this perhaps is the best learning phase for the students. Learning to adapt to crisis, it can't get better learning than that. Uh, and let's accept and understand the situation. This is perhaps only the beginning. And, you know, we coined the word sustainability and sustainable development uh, early, you know, uh, right since the Burns and Commission. And we were talking about the fact that we need to take care of our, you know, uh, younger generation. And uh, sorry, uh, we need to take care of the resources for the future generations, right? When they grow up, they need to have a good quality of life. And that future generation is the current generation who is growing up in these schools, right? Um, so they need to understand very well that uh, we haven't been able to fix the problem. And with coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, and so many other issues, uh, quite possible that climate change is 
and global warming and you know the result of other unsustainable practices will result in greater crises and more long lasting crises in the next few years to come and if they are able to learn with this you know global pandemic now it's perhaps one of the best learnings that they have that will help them adapt in the next few years um so even when they are at home even when they are you know uh, being asked to not mingle restrict their activities it is a learning and it's a very important life for them um on that note i also want to highlight the fact that um the school schools as 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 stakeholders are also playing a very important role in sustaining how we can still operate on the sustainable sustainable development goals you know um, health and safety and continuing education in one form or the other is perhaps the most critical sd you know uh, most critical sustainable goals that uh, we can focus on right now this will actually have implications on all other goals also so that's very very important uh, i think uh, some of the common points that came from all our three panelists was that whatever be the resources that they have whatever be the challenges and limitations schools must continue to operate in whatever capacity that they can um and this is this problem alone is not uh, uh schools to solve i think schools will need the right kind of support and cooperation from the parents uh and the example which again came from dr michael that you know um the requirement for additional 60 devices was fulfilled in you know in just about a week time uh imagine had that not been fulfilled that would have been such a problem and this is just you know this is one example there would be so many examples in other forms where it is other stakeholders such as parents do not come forward it will be more problematic right so i think different stakeholders need to come together in tandem and help each other uh, i think that's going to be very important um additionally um the government may come up with a guidelines at some point of time or the other but uh, i think even before that the schools will have to figure out what they can do and largely the kind of the kind of accountability um i'm sensing from the schools and especially um you know uh, shiru ma'am dr michael dr rata i think it's incredible uh and there's yeah, just a little more kind of support from parents from the government and some other um, uh stakeholders that may come in the form of um uh, let's say a uh, corporate social responsibility or um, non-profit organizations i think uh it will become lot easier to handle uh and the road you know the road forward definitely demands a collaborative effort rather than uh, just having schools shoulder the you know shoulder most part of the responsibility uh on that note uh we also understand that there are a lot of questions which are unanswered right uh questions with respect to what the operating standard procedure would be when the schools reopen in a more nuanced manner and then they do um when 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 those uh, uh operating procedures are taken in what are the challenges which will still persist you know um when we are talking about really understanding the expectations and uh uh key thoughts of all stakeholders there will be a need to facilitate the uh, interaction between parents and schools and uh teachers and other you know other stakeholders to understand uh and put together a lot of different variety of thoughts uh and then come up with different approaches for different scenarios because i think again india stands out in terms of its diversity in background uh, its heterogeneity and therefore we need different approaches as well and uh, uh because of all these reasons uh in ecologic has also decided to sort of take up a very detailed study wherein we will be talking to a lot of stakeholders and and if we can compile those thoughts uh, and those insights and intelligence which can come in handy for a lot of other stakeholders and a lot of other schools to kind of uh, understand uh, of different possibilities and scenarios uh, hopefully that would help them as well in terms of uh, planning uh, better uh, and on the again um, i would uh, uh, request uh anybody who uh, who thinks that this is an important step to uh, reach out to us to help us support us uh so that we can come up with a very comprehensive intelligence that we can share with schools and play some kind of role there yeah thank you alok thank you 
uh, you know, adding on one last point here, uh, you know, uh, going forward, uh, we are going to, you know, take in opinions from multiple stakeholders and not to forget students, you know, as Dr. Michael very well highlighted, these policies are created by people like all of us. Yeah. And we are not sure, we can never go into the minds of these young people and understand what they are going through, what are their needs. So it's important to bring them in the forefront now and see, seek their opinion on what they would need, whether or not we'll be able to implement all of these, uh, it doesn't matter, but it's important to bring them in this discussion uh, and to give them that positivity that it's affecting you, the school is yours, and it's important that you are together in this process. That's very important. And with that note, I would like to thank Ms. Shilu, Dr. Michael, for taking out their time, and Dr. Lata, who has to leave early. Uh, all of you have set the stage for a very important discussion, a very important you know, report that we'll be working on. And your insights are going to be very, very important for this one. Thank you so very much for joining us. I would like to thank all our attendees. We have about 100 plus uh, attendees uh, today. Very uh, good participation here. Lots of questions uh, that people have raised and which we'll continue to answer in our future discussions. Thank you so very much, all of you. Uh, for all our attendees, I would request the admin uh, you know, to add in the links to our uh, web pages, uh, Sustainability Today and Vecologic Youth and our uh, social media handles so that you can follow us for our regular updates and other activities. Right, so here before we, uh, before we conclude, um, I think uh, on behalf of everybody else, I think rest of the world minus uh, teachers and educators, I would like to sincerely thank the efforts of the likes of Silu Ma'am, Dr. Michael, and uh, Dr. Lata, and all other educators for the kind of effort they've been putting in. Uh, quite often in our courses, we, thank, we tend to thank the frontliners and doctors and, and, and health service providers. But I think what teachers are doing right now and educators are doing right now is uh, no less. So thank you one more time um, for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye.